among the really grand terms of law are equal protection mm -hmm. of the laws under the 14th Amendment, you know, enshrined both in the state and California constitutions. Obviously a term that means a great deal to you because you, your dissent in the most recent case on Proposition 8 um, said that it was a, a violation of equal protection. Could you just talk a little bit about how you arrived at the decision, what you think equal protection means, particularly in this context, and sort of where you see the law going in this area? Well, you know, to put it uh, simply, and I don't know if I said this in the opinion, but this is certainly what I was thinking, uh, you know, the two components to equal protection, there's equal, and equal means equal, not less than equal, and it means it applies to all people. And the history of equal protection in our jurisprudence really deals with protecting uh, disfavored minorities, going back to Caroline Product's footnote four that we all studied in law school. I don't know how many lawyers there <laughs> are here, but the whole idea of having, of, of conferring that kind of protection on disfavored uh, classes of, of people is really how equal protection has evolved over the years in the United States. So in, in my view, uh, to, to chip away at the concept of equal protection in, 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 in when, when analyzing human relationships, intimate human relationships, it's something that you can't do because uh, the, the majority opinion says that they're making a limited exception to equal protection. Well, if you're making a limited exception to equal protection, then you no longer have equal protection. And my view, that, and my view was that that concept of equal protection is so, so enshrined in our Constitution, and given our ruling in the, 19, in the 2008 uh, marriage case, where we found that uh, gays and lesbians were suspect classes, and that really was the landmark part of that case because no other court had made that determination. T tell the, t let me know, just tell the audience what a suspect class is because not everybody may be familiar with that term. Well, I mean, over, over, uh, over the decades in our jurisprudence, certain uh, classes uh, like race and ethnic origin and nationality have been conferred special uh, status, special protection. Uh, and they're very, very limited. In fact, the U.S. Supreme Court has not sought really to expand those protected uh, classes. Even gender doesn't fall into the, the very special protected class mm -hmm. that would engender strict scrutiny. And if you are going to make a, a distinction, you need a compelling government interest. So really the landmark uh, uh, basis of the marriage uh, case was to find sexual orientation as a class, as a suspect class, entitled to, to strict scrutiny if there was any kind of uh, distinctions being made between gays uh, and, and non-gays. I mean, that's putting it uh, very, uh, very simply. So, uh, in my view, given our court's ruling from 2008, uh, conferring that status on sexual orientation, to then say that uh, under an equal protection analysis you could have a limited exception on what the whole battle was about, and that was the denomination of marriage. As we have here in California, a Domestic Partnership Act that confers essentially the same rights and obligations as, as marriage. So the whole argument was about marriage, and the whole decision was about that. So to back away from that, uh, I thought required uh, a revision of the Constitution and not an amendment, as my colleagues uh, found. I mean, it's a close issue, and I think reasonable people can, can uh, disagree on, on the, the right approach and what the right answer is. But uh, in my mind, uh, this was so significant uh, a distinction that the majority was making that I couldn't really uh, accept it. Okay. Until 1967, there were 16 states in this country, all in the South, where interracial marriage was prohibited. And that year, the Supreme Court, um, in an opinion written by uh, then Chief Justice Earl Warren, unanimously struck down. It wasn't Warren. He wasn't on the court. Oh, you're right. Yes, you're he right. was. You're right. You're right. You're right. No, I'm he, thinking, he, didn't, he didn't go I'm off until a year later. I'm thinking 1948. I'm thinking 1948. Right. He, and, and he said at the time, under our Constitution, the freedom to marry or not marry a person of, an, of another race resides with the individual and cannot be infringed by the state. When do you think that there will be a consensus about that in this country when it comes to gay marriage? 
you know, my, my guess is as good as any's, I guess, when you say a consensus among the states and society. Uh, I'm not sure if it'll happen in, in, in my lifetime. Uh, you know, I was born in 1948, and I was thinking when you're talking about the case of, about Perez versus Sharp, mm -hmm. and that was the landmark uh, California Supreme Court case that preceded Loving versus Virginia, which you're referring to. Right. Uh, so 60 years later, in 2008, our court made its landmark ruling on sexual orientation. I sort of see that as a bookend mm -hmm. in terms of uh, my life experience, and I thought that it would be a firm uh, bookend, and it didn't turn out to be so. So the U.S. Supreme Court was 19 years behind the California Supreme Court in terms of a interracial marriage. Mm -hmm. You know, where are we now? Where are the states now in terms of, of uh, sexual orientation uh, and gay marriage? Uh, what are there now? Five states, I think, that have have adopted it. Mm -hmm. uh, when we as a nation will uh, adopt it legally. I, I think the, the legal change is going to come before the societal change. 